All right, Kelsey, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, really excited to dig in here. Um, so maybe we could start by you telling us a little bit about your journey and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, I'm always excited to talk partnerships. Um, it was, I'll, I'll take a Sheryl Sandberg quote and say that it's, my experience is that it's less about climbing a ladder and it's more like a jungle gym. Um, I've had a, a couple of different roles in different industries. Uh, but then when I look back on it, I find that a lot of the common thread is, is partnerships. So um, I started as an inner city school teacher in Miami. And I, I did that for a few years. And then I went into the nonprofit space uh, working for City Gear. And I was managing a partnership with John Hopkins and another local partner. And we would essentially be setting up a, a new partnership, a new organization, a new ecosystem in a different school every year. And um, I enjoyed that work, decided to go in to um, get my MBA, moved up from Florida to Boston. Um, Weather-wise, that wasn't a great choice, but education-wise <laughs> it was. Um, and then when I got there, I started working in the travel industry and I was running a a sales team and helping a founder be able to to scale her her influence into a multinational organization and and what I saw that she needed um, was was a lot of architecting figuring out you know sales marketing operations processes that scale and that gave me a lot of passion for figuring out how do you find efficiencies how do you uh, be able to create a system in which you are focused on the things that are only within your control, the things that only you can solve for and everything else is, is delegated out. I got a bit of the startup bug there. And after that, I launched my, my own company, Boston Juicing, and we opened up three brick and mortar stores within one year. Wow. Totally different um, going from teaching to travel to juicing, but the cool part of that, and this is where I think I really started to flex my, my partnership muscles, is that the way that we expanded was through partnerships. That's how we opened three stores within one year. So the first store, the second store that we opened was within a gym. And we realized that they needed to bring people in. They had the space, they had the market, but they didn't have, you know, they weren't equipped to be able to create their own juices and smoothies and things that their, that their customers wanted. So I worked with them to set up an agreement where we would use the space and give them a portion of our proceeds. That helped us to start a second store with very little overhead, very little sunk cost. And then from there, the third store was an opportunity with a major clothing brand that was coming into town and they needed a local audience and they didn't have an in. What I had was an in. I created a great community that was very robust, that was very linked to the local ecosystem. And what their hopes was, they had a commercial kitchen space within their department store. And they said, look, if you can help to bring in the local crowd and make this a fun and friendly place, then we'll do the same thing. We'll, we'll just take a, a portion of the proceeds, but open up the store for you. And that was really exciting. That taught me a lot about how you can use partnerships to scale quickly and also, there was a lot of wasted time in there, too, if I'm going to be honest. There was a lot of partnerships that I tried to pursue and realized that they weren't a great idea, that they weren't really going to help me, that it, it was it was wasting some time. So it was, it was sorting out some of the good with the bad. And then at a point, I realized that I enjoyed what I did, but it's not the ind industry that I saw myself scaling in for another 20 or so years. And at that point, I was approached by HubSpot for startups. And there, you know, I got the opportunity to do a little bit of everything that I love. I get to educate startups and founders, create great content to be able to teach them how to scale their, their sales org, their, their marketing, talk about SEO, all the things that founders really need to be able to build their, their business. And at the same time, I'm able to give um, software and discounts to founders to be able to use a program that I really love and stand behind because HubSpot helped me to scale as a startup. And now I run a team across the Americas. I, I focus a lot on San Francisco and the Bay Area, obviously startup city. Uh, but we now have an entire team that is that is running this 
across over 5,000 partners. Wow. And it's been an exciting ride thus far. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. 5,000 partners. I know what that feels like. Uh, and it's a, um, yeah, there, there, there's so many different levels to the game that you're playing at this point, you know, cause you, like you, it's, it's not like you're doing all oh, bottoms up or you're doing kind of like enterprise partnership approach. It's kind of like you're playing every game at the same time, uh, which is really, really cool. Uh, I would love to start at the start. Now, this, I think I have this in my heart a little bit because my sister's a school teacher. She's a high school teacher. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's a tough job, right? It's a really tough job. And uh, she does an amazing job of it. I like, I would love for her to work in a job that's less tough because she also works with mm. kind of like in like quite tough inner city schools in the UK. Um, and so, like, I would love for her to find a career that's like, maybe a little bit less intense I'd, okay i'm like yeah. under I'm nobody under... goes into teaching for the cush benefits so yeah exactly exactly yeah she loves it and it's her passion but i would love to hear from you reflecting back because i imagine with all of the enablement and training and support and like education that you must do with the folks in the program today i'm sure that a ton of those skills you developed back then carry over. And then, like, I would love to just hear like reflections on that. Like now looking back, like what skills or like what muscles do you flex uh, from your teacher days that are like applicable to what you're doing like right now? That is such a fun question. So much actually. Um, first of all, kids are a hard audience especially middle and high schoolers, they will tell you exactly like it is and they don't care at all about your, your feelings because you're an adult and they assume you don't have any. Yeah. Um, so having to deal with being on, you have to be on all day for eight hours and dealing with that and getting used to that meant that when I was in a boardroom or doing a presentation or when I got into HubSpot and a lot of people shied away from public speaking, and shied away from creating new educational content for founders and were nervous to be put on the spot, those things, things came pretty easily to me. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's part of it. And I also, one huge part that I learned as a teacher was backwards planning. When I was, um, I, I taught uh, anywhere from kindergarten through working with high school. And what I realized with my kindergartners was when I saw what their goals were at the end of the year and I saw the curriculum, the curriculum wasn't going to get them to where they needed to, to hit their end goals. Yeah. So what I did is I figured how many words do they need to learn by the end of the year in order to be successful? And then I broke that down and backwards planned all the way to day one. And so that way I had benchmarks to make sure that we not only met, but exceeded our goals. And it seems really simple. That's with kindergartners, but I approach every, every new challenge that way. Yeah. Uh, when I went into HubSpot and when I, started to grow this program, I thought about, okay, where's the end goal that we want to get to, whether it's this year, this quarter, and then what are the milestones that we have to hit to get there? Yeah, I absolutely love that. Like it, all, all of those, I think are incredibly powerful for someone to be successful, like in, in the office, but I think especially in a partnerships role and like backwards planning, particularly, you know, if you can get together especially if you can go through that process with the partner but if you can get together with the partner and like backwards plan yourself from like success down to hey like what are the milestones we need to achieve along the way you're you're at the elite level of partner managers i would say to be honest you know like that that is something that um is the exception because a lot of people are just kind of operating in the day-to-day -day and they're doing great work and they're just trying to like get through the week or just trying to get through the month, through the quarter. And so they're like doing the work and they're staying really busy. But um, I think something like that is like a really powerful tool to use. And then uh, you mentioned something else, which it sounded like you potentially had a tool for as well, or at least like uh, kind of an approach or a mantra on, which like really resonated with me, which is uh, like focusing on the things you can control. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I think, one of the biggest areas where partner teams struggle is they end up getting distracted by things that they aren't in their control 
but that they think other people care about in the business or like mm-hmm. you know that those things will help them demonstrate the value of their partner business and thus like kind of help them get to where they want to be and very often it's like hey you know that shared metric with that team is fine and this other thing is okay but like unless you crush the thing that you're meant to be controlling and owning like none of that other stuff matters and so i'd love like to hear a little bit about like how you would like what tips do you have for people that, that can like maybe they need help with this and they can really nail down like what it is that they can control and how what they, they should be focusing on because it sounded like you kind of you had an opinion on that this is this is something i'm so passionate about i'm glad you brought it up um one thing that i'll share so a resource that really informs my my framing around this is the book essentialism by greg McEwen. he also has an amazing podcast has um, a great weekly email and this is something that i share with my team as well And it is, you know, really thinking about like, how do you focus on the essential few things that are going to drive impact and not get distracted by other things? I thought that this was one of the most tactical books to help me get there. So I would say that's part of it. The other thing is you have multiple sets of stakeholders. You have your internal stakeholders. So what does your leadership care about? One of the things that surprised me going into the partnership role I knew that it was cross-functional, but I didn't realize how much my role was internal selling and getting other teams on board and understanding how everybody could work together to be able to further this mission. The, The other piece that I think is absolutely essential. So in any of our calls, when we meet with a partner first, first time, we go into getting to understand their goals. And one of the questions that I really love about that is not only understanding what are your goals, you know, our, our program, we partner with venture capital, accelerators, incubators, but you can use this for any program. And I go in and I ask, not only what are your goals for your program? How do you work with, with your constituents, your customers, your founders, but what are your personal goals? How are, how is your performance measured? What does success look like at the end of this quarter, at the end of this year? And sometimes people will balk a little bit and be like, well, that's not entirely related to the startups program. And like, I don't know how you're going to help me do this. But then you, you know, when, once you talk to them, you're like, well, you don't know if I can help you do that yet. So let's find out. And there's been some amazing partnerships we've been able to forge out of that. It might start with a sponsorship conversation and somebody might be like, okay, all we care about is sponsorship dollars. I think we've all probably been there in one realm or another, show me the money. And then you can ask, okay, but how are you evaluated? Oh, you're evaluated by how many new customers you can bring in. Well, here's my brand reach. I I can contribute that. Is part of that sponsorship dollars, does that include in-kind? And they're like, I don't know. Okay, go back and check. And it ends up that 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 was part of it. And I said, okay, you know, we can do this, we can do that. But even with, um, there's a great partner that we're, we were working with recently and they are a startup and they were talking about, they really wanted to get this sponsorship signed and, and to be able to get some funds in and the price that they wanted was a lot higher than what we were able to do. But then when you really dig into what do you care about? Okay. You're going up for your next funding round. You need to be able to show your investors that this is a great deal. Would you like a testimonial from HubSpot? You know, what, what else can we do? So I just encourage people to get creative and that's how you can marry, um, figuring out what your internal stakeholders need with what your external stakeholders need. And then if you figure out those two things and then you focus on essentialism, like what are the things that, you know, you can do to move those specific things to be able to get that win either internally or externally, any new partnership that I do, I try and think of like, how can I get a quick win? then those things will really set you up with a foundation for a great relationship moving forward. Amazing. I absolutely love that. And I have like a hundred additional questions off the back of it because it went in so many cool directions. I think like where I'd love to start with that is like, so having that conversation with your partners is essential, right? And again, I think you're really operating at the elite level or like that where, where you're having those meaningful conversations with partners and understanding what their goals are and like what success really looks like to them. Um, to your point, I do think like sometimes people show up not 
willing to have that conversation. And sometimes I think partners show up, especially like, you know, I spent a lot of my time partnering with uh, agencies, consulting companies, like folks that maybe don't have as much of a metrics oriented culture. Like sometimes they show up and then they're not prepared or capable of having that conversation. And like, so how do you, how do you take a partner through that journey? I guess, like if it, either they're unwilling to, or like incapable of having a conversation around like what success looks like to them in the partnership. Totally. Uh, well, a lot of our partnerships are with venture capitalists. They don't even put their emails online because they don't want you to contact them. And they expect that you will jump through all the hoops to figure out a connection to them if you want to even get an email into their inbox. A lot of them do not or do not want to sit here and talk about your goals. So with some of these, granted, there's there's different approaches, but I we took a step back and we did a lot of investigating and trying to figure out what is the theme across this partner type? What are the things that they really need and that they are focused on? Whether or not it's exactly what we say, how can we improve our value proposition to them? So if we take that example, we have a lot of VCs that weren't necessarily ready to talk with us. We're like, we'll just take that perk. We'll like let it, we'll put it on a homepage and we'll just kind of let it die there. You're welcome. And I was like, that's actually not a partnership. That's, that's not what we want at all. I'd rather just not partner if that's the case. And that takes them by surprise. So one thing is don't be afraid to say no to the, to people that aren't ready to engage in a proper partnership with you. Yeah. We got to a point, you know, every different level that we've achieved with HubSpot for startups, 5,000 partners are great. We've gone through a lot of different pivots there. And there is a lot of those partners that aren't effective partners. And we had yeah. to, we had to lose those partners. So I would say that's part of it, but then also doing an assessment of what their needs are. They have a lot of startups that are coming to them for help, for resources. And they, it might be one venture capitalist to 80 startups. That's, that's a tough number. I know what it's like to educate over 80 students. So I know that there's going to be a strain on them to be able to create the resources and education they need for their startups to scale. So two things that, that I think make us successful in this realm are one, making sure that we align with what they care about. They care about their founder's success. So we put founders as the most important part. If your founders are successful, then we will be successful. I'll make this three points. That's <laughs> it. The second point um, is that we, uh, I thought about like, what are their struggles and how can we alleviate them? You can't possibly help all of these startups do all the things that they need to. They're very technical. They might not have experience in sales or marketing. We do. We have well, content and resources about that. I can help your startup scale faster with less input and time from you so you can do more investments. Now we're cooking. Now we're, we're, we have a value proposition that may be landing. Um, and gosh, what was, what was my third point in this? I, I lost it. Um, we'll, we'll stop, we'll stop there with, with those two. I think that, um, those can both be really impactful. Yeah. Awesome. And yeah, we can trim it. Um, so perfect. And then, uh, so we do a, we partner a lot with VCs, um, uh, at deal, uh, is it, like, it's definitely one of our bigger channels as well. And like, we, um, we run into like similar situation where, Hey, we have the perks and discounts type approach. And then we also help like with workshops and educational things, um, uh, to help companies grow their like scale their businesses internationally and yet you know, in this environment i think particularly this is relevant for vcs who do want to help their companies grow and scale in a way that uh still makes sense from a cash burn perspective and so like we're in a really good spot with that kind of educational position that we take i do feel like to your point and i've worked at a vc for a little while so i've been on the other <laughs> side of the uh, table on this as well i like as of in the VC space, like you are very used to people reaching and chasing you down, like you mentioned, and then like coming to you with the pitch and like you kind of like deciding yes or no, like, and you know, like that is like, that is just the, the power dynamic traditionally. 
And so I think it's really, and also like, unless you're associated to some sort of hot deal that they're trying to do, or that they've recently done that can, uh, that they can add value to, like, it's really hard for you to get anyone's attention. And so like, I would just love to hear, like, how do you capture the attention of a VC when number one, like they're, they're seeing a thousand pitches a year from founders. And then number two, like, unless it's like really tightly tied to a, the last board meeting that they had or a hot deal that they're trying to do or just did, then it's just not relevant to them. How do you like capture that attention? Yeah. Uh, I would say, well, one of the things that I think is really important is to have the mindset of giving first. I think that that, that goes across partnerships. So we don't go in and say, okay, how many startups can you funnel our way? We want you to do this. We, so we quantify what the value of this of this discount is. On average, it's twenty thousand dollars. VCs care about this currency. They live mm. in a world of numbers. So let's start there. Yeah. Um, so align with them on on what they care about. But then also, as you said, if you aren't associated with one of their startups or one of their hot recent deals, but why can't you be? Go on mm-hmm. to Crunchbase. Figure out who they just invested in. Figure out whether or not that person needs HubSpot get them on the hook and then say, Hey, would you like 90% off $20,000 and another like 80,000 associated discounts with our partners like deal. And they say, yeah, I would absolutely like that value. Great. Will you go to your venture capital connection and you are eligible if your venture capital connection is part of our partner program. That's how we vet people. You're, you have to belong to an accelerator incubator or VC. That's part of our, our network. And then we work with the startup to be able to get that VC to be able to apply. Yeah. That would be one approach. The other approach that that I would say, and I think this works across partnerships, we have great tools like LinkedIn Sales Navigator. And that also integrates with the HubSpot CRM, which makes my life very easy. But if somebody's not wanting to talk to me, it's very easy with social networks to see who they do want to talk to and who they are interested in and who they are following. And it might mean that you are liking, commenting, following on their posts or following on you know people that they're associated with for a little while before you make that initial ask. One of my pet peeves are the people that reach out to me on LinkedIn with zero context and just a, you know, a sales pitch immediately. There's, there's no kind of thought about the value that they're bringing. And so don't be that person. There's been venture capitalists that I really wanna get on their radar and they're not ready. So I make friends with everybody around them and then I eventually asked one of those people for an introduction. And at that point they're like, okay, I'm surrounded. Let's do this. <laughs> That's awesome. It's really smart. And I think like so much of venture capital operates on introductions and connections between people that that is like a very astute tip to share. It's like, you know, if getting an introduction from someone in their network that they that they are like that, that maybe they owe a favor to or they want to uh they want them to owe a favor is like so much in the vc world i actually when it, like when i was working at ggb capital which was an awesome team my boss there who's one of the uh partners in the firm shared like this incredible insight to me that was just like um and such a such an awesome example of the chess game that he like the 4d chess that he was playing you know it was like uh we we had this great deal that came in and it was really interesting it kind of fit into our thesis i was like oh wow this is an amazing deal he's gonna be really excited about this and we caught up after the call and i was like oh so what do you think and he was like it's great but it um like it doesn't do anything more for me and i was like wait what 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 do you mean by that and he was like well um you know, we see thousands of deals a year. And so I'm not just looking at whether this company is going to be successful or not, you know, because like lots of these companies are going to be successful. But I'm also looking at like, is this an introduction from someone who, you know, I, if I take this introduction, then maybe I can get more pipeline in the future. Or is this going to feel a need of one of my portfolio companies and or could they be a customer for one of my portfolio companies and so like and so i can make introductions uh, that way as well and like everything in that there was like multiple layers to this deal and like helping people out and like making connections between all of these different people it kind of like reminds me of how a rubber band ball comes together you know and it's like layers and layers and layers of connections um and 
it, it, that's kind of how you have to play the VC game a little bit. So you have to like get into that like connection introduction type game. And it sounds like uh, you figured that out and how to get into that network, which is really cool. And I think people that are listening to this that are interested in partnering with uh, venture firms will have to figure that out. And it's it's not something you can kind of hack your way into. I think it has to be a talent, uh, which is really, really cool to hear. So thank you for sharing that. I, like it, jumping into the your boston juicing company because i think that's so cool uh that you started that company actually my best friend and best man uh in my wedding uh had a a, a cold press juicing company as well um and uh spent a few times there uh and uh, still have some ginger shops once in a while <laughs> uh but um i w- i'm really interested in the partnerships there i think like Many people, again, I think it's very analogous to services companies, like where if you're a tech company and you're trying to go and partner with like a consulting company, like you're talking a completely different language, mm-hmm. you know? And I think you as like a kind of like a food and beverage type company going and talking to a gym, like you're really talking different languages. And I imagine there's like different licensing and all of those things involved. So like, how do you find a common ground with a partner like that, like a gym or, you know, you mentioned an apparel company as well, like where even though you're approaching things from completely different places, you're able to find a way for a partnership to work out? Yeah. Well, I think it's a lot of the same skills. It's a lot of figuring out how do they judge their own success. The gym wanted more people in the door. They, they were new. So if we could add to their foot traffic and we could enhance the value proposition of the people there, then that's a win. But it also took a series of conversations to make that happen. It took uh, first just being a genuine customer and coming in and supporting their business. And again, that's part of that give first mentality. Let me support your community. And then with both of them, it was figuring out what is, what's a quick win that I can do? For the apparel company, it was how many people can I bring to their grand opening? And can I make several quality introductions there without anything that is going to benefit back to me necessarily, but can I create value for the people in my ecosystem? And same with, with the gym. And also I think as a partnership professional, it's important to have an owner's mindset to think about this as your own business, your own initiative and, and taking that full ownership. Because then when I got into those conversations and I'm talking with other owners and they're seeing that, I care about not just solving the problem of how can I get a juice bar in there, but also thinking about what other problems are you solving for? Oh, could I introduce you to an electrician that you may need? Could I um, help you with some ideas for this? And it became something where as, as owners together, we would be able to lean on each other and be able to brainstorm a little bit together. And you, as you build these relationships, it becomes a more and more uh, elite thing where you've built up that trust. And after a series of conversations and figuring out what's the most impactful thing that not only in the long term, but you've got to think about how can you create impact in the short term and then executing on that. And also continuously going back to them, checking in, getting feedback, making sure that they're happy with the progress, that they're happy with the direction. I think that with any partnership, it's important to have those check-in moments and also be open to a reset if you need to. I talked earlier about how important that initial conversation is of getting to what their goals are. Not everybody's going to do that in the first conversation, or you might have a partnership that you've inherited and you weren't there for that foundation call. It's never too late to go back and say, Hey, we have a lot of great momentum. I'm really excited to continue our conversation. Do you mind if I get to understand a little bit more of what makes you tick so I can make sure that I'm additive? Mm. Yeah. I love that. I really love that. A very cool one. I think, uh, Again, like you were talking about, uh, like finding the shared goals and understanding like what creates value for each other, like being able to approach a conversation with a beginner's mindset and like understanding those things early on is, uh, is really smart and a very, um, kind of like very tactical, useful tips that people can take away from this. Uh, so I'd love to jump into talking about the uh, startup program or what you're doing at HubSpot today. So could, could we just start with uh, at a high level? Why do, why does a company like start, uh, HubSpot need a startup program or what, what, like, what does it do for the business there? 
Absolutely. This has been one of our fastest growing partnership programs at HubSpot. And I, I can't share what the exact number is, but it's a massive portion of our overall global revenue as part of our go-to-markets motion. And we were one of the very first SaaS companies to create a startup program. We've been going for 10 years strong now. And where this came from is we realized that there were a lot of founders that needed access to our resources, but our pricing just was, was not making that you know, that possible for them. And so they were starting with competitors and then we were dealing with how are we going to switch them off of competitors and sell yeah. them onto some, someone else off of their legacy program later on. It's just not, it's not a great use of, of time and resources. And if we could help startups early on and be able to help them scale and be part of that journey and be more than just a, a SaaS platform, but also help them figure out the, the things that they need to scale. Again, technical founders, they may have never worn a marketing hat. And all of a sudden they're sitting there and saying, how do I attract people to my business? And uh, you don't want to hire a consultancy or something to do that. You might, but oftentimes you don't have that, that, uh, that resource. So we thought a lot about what founders needed and created a comprehensive program to do that. So we start at 90% off. So if you're seed or up to $2 million in funding, you get 90% off in year one, 50% off that next year, and then you get an ongoing discount of 25% off. And that enables our startups to be able to start at a cost that they can handle, but then be able to scale with us as their revenue increases. And that program has grown so quickly into so many different partnerships. It has been really exciting. And we are now supporting over 20,000 founders. Wow. Yeah, and I, I mean, 90% off definitely sounds uh, attractive. I can imagine that catches people's attention. Uh, so uh, hats off on that one. And um, like, tell me, so who is a great fit for this program? Is there, is there like um, outside of the stage of funding, is there like other characteristics you're looking at where you would say, okay, that's like perfect prototypical uh, kind of founder fit that you're looking for? Yeah. Um, well, HubSpot spans across so many different industries. So there's a lot of different use cases there. But one thing that I remind people is that HubSpot's a freemium model and you can start at the free and it doesn't time you out. Really? What I try to encourage founders to do, and whether it's a founder or even if you're in the partnership space, the CRM is free. It will always be free. You should have a system of record for who you're talking to. We are, we, our currency is relationships as partnerships folks, and you need a way to be able to manage those relationships. So for our startups, I say, start on the free. You'd be surprised how many people get to series A and are still working out of Google docs and you are wasting a lot of time and resources. And one of the things that I experienced as a founder was that I went in for like every free discount trial deal that I could get to kind of build my, my tech stack. And then at the end of the day, I realized that none of them talked to each other. My data was terrible. I wasn't able to get actionable insights to make good decisions, which meant that I was wasting money on other things because I didn't know how effective they were. So when we look at founders, I would say there's different products for you at different times. But start okay. on the free and then scale as as you go. We have a CRM, we have a sales hub, marketing hub, service hub, ops hub, CMS hub, and then 1100 integrations. So that's a whole different partnerships team. So shout out to our ecosystem uh, partnerships team. But it really enables you to have everything you need to scale. Awesome. Awesome. And like, uh, like what's the... Uh... What's the kind of process for someone to get on board with something like this? Is it like, do you vet them? Like, do they need to like qualify? Like, can they just kind of sign up and get a quick approval? Like, how does that work? Yeah, we try to make it pretty painless. Um, that's, that's a great tip for, for anybody in the <laughs> partnership space. Don't make it too hard. We vet them through their association. So they need to be able to be part of a partner that we have approved just because yeah at 90% off, if, if they're not successful, we're losing money. Love and it. that means that we don't actually make a return on those startups till year three 
as a no. founder, I actually really like that because that shows that we have to be aligned with helping you grow for a minimum of three years. Otherwise we lose along with you. So I would say that that is, that that is part of it. Um, we'll have to edit this part out. Go back to the question. Yeah, no, I was saying about uh, like, how does someone qualify and what's the process? Ah, okay. And then to apply, you just go to hubspot.com forward slash startups. And you can either select who your partner is from the drop down list, or if you are a venture backed startup, part of an accelerator, incubator, even some co working spaces, then you can just ask them for their unique partner code. And when you sign up, it takes five minutes, you get the free CRM. And then you can be on that until you are ready to go onto the paid. Interesting. And so the thing I like, I, there's a lot I like about this, but um, the thing that I really like about this, and it's very venture, uh, what you're doing, you know, it's like venture is like a, a filtering system. Like we talked about leveraging like relationships in introductions, but like so much of what people do in venture is like follow ons from other smart people's diligence, you know? And so it's like, Hey, if this, angel investor invested, then they probably did a certain level of work. And then if this seed investor invested mm -hmm. and like this series, A, and like, as you get kind of like further along the line, like the diligence changes and the people kind of trust the people before them to have done like their kind of diligence. And then they kind of come in and do their own. And you're almost using that as like a filtering for folks that are going into the, the program where it's like, okay, well, if these folks have gotten funding from one of our startups or participated in one of these programs, then it's likely that they've met X, Y, and Z criteria. And like in something there, there's someone that is worth making this bet on because ultimately that's what you're doing, right? It's like, you're, you're making an upfront bet of, even though it's a discount, like really you like, you are spending money in order to hopefully like make those people successful and capture that revenue in like further down the line when they are. Absolutely. And we, we look at it and we think, well, if Andreessen Horowitz thinks that this startup is good enough, then we can put our money behind them too. And that's why it's really important to have great quality partners that also understand what you're looking for. And then you can enable each other to grow. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Uh, really, really cool. And very, very smart. I didn't say like, I know when we were talking before we started recording, you mentioned that HubSpot uses HubSpot for all of the uh, partner activities that the team does, um, which makes sense. Also, uh, I think is really interesting. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit about like how, how that works and maybe like some of the things that are unique about how you're using, we, we, we're HubSpot customers uh, within partnership leaders. And so we use the products a lot. So I, I'm in there and I get to see uh, how the product works. I'm interested to understand like what you can kind of do uniquely by using HubSpot uh, as, as a HubSpot partner team. Absolutely. I, I will say I do feel so spoiled by the software that we have that I know that if I ever were to leave HubSpot, I would put it into my contract that they need to implement HubSpot because I really don't want to work in anything outside of it. It just makes my life so easy. I don't understand what I did before. The first part of that is just a CRM. As, as I, I had said, we are currencies relationships. You need to be able to track those relationships. You can also set reminders and tasks and make that frictionless. One of the things it's, it's so basic, but if you take HubSpot is, is if you kind of took the core parts of, let's say Salesforce, Calendly, Zendesk, Hootsuite, MailChimp, rolled those into one and added a few things. That's essentially what we do. So things as basic as the calendar invite tool. When you're working with VCs or anywhere else, you only have so many at-bats with them and so much friction that you can create before you don't become worth it because they're not invested in you yet. So making it really easy to book with you, but then it also will keep track of all of your emails, all of your meetings, all of your contact with that person, and it will enable you to collaborate with, with other people on your team, whether you're out, whether you hand over that partner to somebody else, it's so invaluable to be able to see the history of that contact and see what they've done to date. And it makes those transitions so much more seamless. That would be part of it. The other thing is we use the sales pipeline for partnerships. You can customize those, those pipelines very easily to be able to create different deal stages. So for us, instead of, you know, that first, um, 
that first stage being maybe outreach quote it's about whether or not they have applied and if, then they if they've applied we have an explore call and then you know there it goes through the steps of the process and that helps us to be able to track our partnerships and using the sales tool then we also get all of the data this part is so important because we need to be able to sell internally and to be able to sell our value and being able to quickly pull up not only how is this accelerating our our growth but you can actually tie these to revenue goals so we put our partners in the system then we have our startup supply through a hubspot form they select who their partner is and then we can see how many how many deals has this partner generated and we can tier them from that and we can figure out who we want to give additional support to that's that's what I would say is the the base part of the partnership side, but if you are a more you know maybe a later stage or more sophisticated partnership where you're also doing marketing, you're creating collateral around it, maybe you're doing social media, social listening, then having a tool where it's not only your CRM but you have the sales pipeline, which is your partner pipeline, and you have marketing that's tied to that, then it gives you a really clear and comprehensive picture of the value that you're adding and where you need to be able to focus more of your time. I love that. And uh, I think some really interesting stuff there. Uh, like we, so we use HubSpot a lot at Beal uh, for our uh, partners. And, you know, like the main thing that works really well for us, particularly our VC partners, but actually across a lot of partners is like, we'll set up custom landing pages with our partners, you know, with like the, the yeah, and, and it's got like their unique value prop and, like maybe a unique discount and some things like that on there. Um, like what kind of things, cause I imagine like you're probably taking this to a different level than what we're doing at the moment. So selfishly, oh, yeah. I'm interested in hearing. Like what kind of things, yeah, tell me, <laughs> like, tell me what you're doing. Give me the inside look. I need these tips. Well, I would say things like the custom landing pages. Um, we're also a content creation engine at HubSpot yeah. and we create a lot of content to be able to attract startups to our program. It's things like we want to, again, give first and be able to give content where whether or not you're on HubSpot, it's going to be valuable. Here's the basics of SEO and where you should start as a founder. And then we're able to nurture those, those startups. Mm -hmm. So having a custom landing page, actually super easy to create, easy to duplicate and just be able to switch out that, that partner name and, and maybe a, a couple sentences. Please. And then it's the nurturing on the back end. That's where this marketing piece comes in. Can you enroll them in a sequence or a workflow that's going to be able to, one, we use that nurturing when it comes to partners. Not everybody replies to the first email, that might shock you, but it enables us to be able to, to bring them along. But once, they, once we have founders that sign up on our landing pages, we're also be, being able to put them into our own content marketing flow. So we can give them the right resources at the right time, and then they can see us as a helpful partner. So once they get to that point where they are considering the CRM or they want sales or marketing, then they will already be like, wow, HubSpot's been really helpful and additive to me. Let me check that out. Yeah, I absolutely love that. Yeah, and it's like planting those seeds, I think, is like the... Um... It's a great way to end the conversation like, you know, like planting those seeds of value and knowing that at some point people will come back. If there's anything that I've seen be successful in partnerships, it's that it's just like, Hey, like be helpful and valuable wherever possible. And like, when it's the right time, people will generally come back uh, and it absolutely awesome. Well, Kelsey, I've appreciated and enjoyed the time so much before you go. I would love to ask you our regular question, which is what's something that you learned recently that you'd like to share with the listeners? Uh, so much, uh, but that will be like a whole nother, another episode. One of the things that's really on my mind, I'm a, I'm a voracious reader. And one of the books that has stood out to me most this year, my second book recommendation of this podcast is Atomic Habits. Wow. And I think this is applicable to work and to life, but it's thinking about, the quality of your habits determine the quality of your work and the quality of your life. And I think there's so many times where we get so focused on goals and just setting these crazy ambitious goals that are really motivating, look good on paper, fire everybody up. And then we don't think about what does it actually take to get there? Not just to get there, but to feel successful on that journey. And 
this book really helped me to do that, to think about not, not just thinking about the end goal, thinking about what is the habit that I want to create and mm. how is that going to enable me to be successful? And when you take that and you pair that with what I discussed earlier with essentialism, being able to focus on those essential few habits that are going to be able to drive the impact that is meaningful to both your internal and external stakeholders and you and your career growth, that's, that's a powerful conglomeration. Yeah, I love that. And I love the book. And actually, I was uh, just talking to my personal trainer about uh, Atomic Habits uh, last week. And he, he's obsessed with it. I think he's read it about 100 times. And he was saying how, um, you know, like so many people that come to him start out with, you know, I want to get, I want to have a six pack or I want to lose a certain amount of pounds or I want to do this or what, do that. And he's like, how about like you want to work out twice a week you know or like how how about like setting some of these goals that are like achievable uh that like are forming the right kind of habits and i think there's so much in partnerships with that like uh you know ultimately if you're trying to build a relationship with you know accenture or with uh deloitte or you know with Andreessen horowitz and they're like larger organizations that are multi-threaded and more complex like you are going to need to build milestones and i liked how you use the term quick wins in order to be able to like for, for people to feel the progress and to form a habit around like hey this is the this is something that's working and i should continue doing this uh and so yeah i i've got it on my bookshelf uh to have another review of actually like i i read it in a little while ago and i need to go back to it um and i would recommend everyone else do the same as well it's an amazing book and i'm going to pick up essentialism as well put it on my list uh so uh, next time we chat i will have had a read of it and i'll tell you what i think um but so awesome kelsey i really appreciate the time it's been super duper helpful as people that are using hubspot in our part of the business right now i'm like selfishly excited to get these tips and you know I'm, I'm excited to share this recording with our uh, venture team as soon as it's done so that we can take some of this and, and implement what we're doing so i'm sure uh, other people listening to this are going to find it really valuable so thank you so much absolutely it's been a ton of fun 